In the year since her official separation from Prince Charles in December 1992, Diana, the Princess of Wales, has carried out over 250 public engagements as a solo performer. She continued to maintain a high public profile and seemed to be carrying on with business as usual. But she was living in a state of limbo, half in and half out of the royal family, with many personal problems unresolved. The pressures eventually grew too much, and she made the unprecedented decision to announce a dramatic change herself. At the end of this year, when I've completed my diary of official engagements, I will be reducing the extent of the public life I've led so far. Let's face it, for 12 years, this woman has been in that relentless spotlight under the, the awful scrutiny of all the media. And I think that'd be difficult for anybody even for one year. She had been under a lot of pressure from Prince Charles and his staff to get out of his way, basically. Uh, you could call it maintaining a lower profile. As the mother of an heir to the British throne, Diana can never be banished altogether. She's been seen at such family events as the summer wedding of Lord Linley, but always it's been without Charles. She's a lone figure, not yet divorced, prevented by both protocol and public opinion from appearing on the arm of a new man. Well, I think from a human point of view, it's very unfortunate that the princess at least until she gets divorced, can't be seen on the arms of men friends. If the books are to believe she hasn't had a sex life with her husband since 1987, we're talking of the world's most attractive woman uh, in her early 30s, it's a tragedy that a woman capable of such love, full of romantic longings, can't be seen on another man's arm at this delicate period in her life because the British people might turn against her, it might be interpreted wrongly. Another wedding brings hope that a commoner marrying into the royal family, this time Serena Stanhope, will have more success than her predecessors. Since the official separation, the Queen has been supportive to Diana, but it's been a difficult year. On the one hand, she's had to cope with extreme public adoration, whilst on the other, she's gone home to an empty house. She's going through the normal period of mourning for the end of a marriage. No matter how unhappy you were in the marriage, there's always a time of adjustment afterwards, and I think it takes at least a year. And so she has got to adjust to, to being a woman on her own, a suddenly single woman. London's Kensington Palace has been Diana's home for 12 years, but she now plans to move out. Known in royal circles as the Aunt Heap, it's a claustrophobic compound where she lives surrounded by royal neighbours. She can also never be sure that she's completely alone. She doesn't trust anyone. Uh, she thinks that the walls of Kensington Palace have ears. I mean, she doesn't quite know. I mean, all the bugging that's gone on. Um, I mean, none of us quite know how it happened. Uh, and she certainly isn't sure, so she feels uncomfortable. I mean, she has a lot of friends, but she trusts very few of them. But loneliness has been a part of her life for longer than anyone realized. The truth about the state of her marriage to Charles only became obvious for all to see in November 1992. There in Korea, the deep-rooted tensions of a marriage in trouble broke to the surface. The charade was over. The body language said it all. I think it was a situation that just couldn't go on any longer because um, we saw when we were on tour with them in Korea that they just couldn't bear to be working together any longer. And that after they arrived in Korea, and we saw what happened the first afternoon when they were there. We went back to our hotel and I just said to every, all the other reporters with me, this is the last tour. They can't go on like this. And it was just obvious to all of us. 
and sure enough, it was the last tour. I mean, if about three weeks later, the official announcement came. Normally a master at hiding her feelings, even Diana knew the game was up. It was a case of just going through the motions. The irony of Charles's speech wasn't lost on his audience. We are fortunate, I think, in the depth of our relationship. In her own mind, Diana was already facing an uncertain future alone. By not maintaining the happy family facade, she was accused of attacking the monarchy itself. The former Lady Diana Spencer is the daughter of a hereditary earl. Her son is going to be a hereditary monarch one day, if the monarchy survives that long. She's not trying to bring down the monarchy. To me, she was modeling the kind of Scandinavian-style monarchy that Britain actually wants to see. She was showing the royal family the way ahead. She was possibly the only way that it could survive. It, it's saving grace. Uh, their big mistake has not been to learn from her example. Diana has never acted shy of the press. During a family holiday with friends on Nevis, an island in the Caribbean, she was aware that the media were watching, but didn't let that spoil her fun. She didn't exchange her bikini for a more covering swimsuit, and she continued to relax with her sons despite the audience. The paparazzi section of the media are a constant pressure. These pushy freelance photographers know that exclusive shots of her private family life will command high prices. When they get too close, however, and threaten to upset her children, she will immediately move to protect them. There was a case in Austria when they were on a skiing holiday earlier this year, and um, the boys were suddenly uh, found that they were crossing a street with their mother, and swarms of Italian paparazzi photographers suddenly leapt out of nowhere and began blazing away, less than a foot away from the end of their noses. And naturally, the police took exception to this and began to try and beat them back. And one phot photographer ended up on the street with a, an English policeman on top of him. And um, I thought the boys handled it quite well, but um, they didn't show too much of a reaction, although they were a bit shocked. But afterwards, apparently, William was very, very upset. It took several hours for him to recover. Now, we've noticed that William doesn't handle these, uh, the, the public um, uh, you know, and the, the, the media as well as Harry does. Harry is absolutely born to be royal because nothing phases him. He's got the cheeriest personality, he's a great little joker, and he sails through everything wonderfully well. But William doesn't. He's like his father. He's very sensitive, very thoughtful boy, and he takes this all very much to heart. William and Harry are also coping with the emotional trauma of their parents' separation. They've taken on some of their, their mother's unhappiness, those children. I think that they've... Um, William is a, a pre-adolescent, and he's taken upon him some of the guilt of his parents' separation. He feels somehow it's his fault that, that Mummy and Daddy aren't happy, and, and, and this is very normal for children to do this. Whereas Harry's a little bit younger and more happy-go-lucky, and I don't think he feels the burden of his parents' separation at all. Diana is showing her sons a more relaxed style of monarchy. Breaking with royal tradition, they took a regular British Rail train for a family visit to Wales. William is a future Prince of Wales, and she'd organised the day as an introduction to the Principality. But the emphasis for this half-term school holiday was on informality. At the Welsh Folk Museum near Cardiff, they were given a taste of travel from a bygone age in a pony and trap. Sharing a private joke, William and Diana found the experience amusing. Yes. <laughs> 
These modest occasions are Diana's way of preparing her son for the spotlight. As a father, Charles has had a critical press, but of course he's not as bad as he's been painted. During off-duty moments, William and Harry are relaxed in his company. Charles is the product of a traditional royal upbringing. His isolated childhood centered around the nursery, nannies and royal manors. Naturally, he's passing on to his sons the same values he was taught. He's been brought up to know that he will one day be king, and his motto, Dean, is I serve. And he has a great sense of duty, which he feels is very important to, still, to instill in his children, particularly William. During family holidays with their father at Sandringham and other royal homes, William and Harry are on their best behavior. In contrast, their mother allows them to enjoy things normal children like to do. As a single royal mum, Diana enjoys a day out with two approved male companions, her detective and her butler, together with his two sons, both good friends of William and Harry's. a popular theme park near London is somewhere Charles would never come to. Already, those children seem to me to be handling their role very well. They're extremely well-mannered children. They're a delight to, to be with. I mean, everybody that has any dealings with them at all says that you couldn't find two lovelier boys. They're normal boys. That's the, that's the lovely thing about them. They don't seem to be affected in any way by, by their upbringing in, in that particular background. These children are growing up in touch with reality, and therefore they're probably the first royal children to do that. And that's what's great about them. Even as products of a broken home, William and Harry enjoy an affluent royal lifestyle. Although Diana insists they experience a normal life, deference and privilege are theirs from birth. As a commoner, Diana brought in new ideas and exposed a royal family living in the past. But where does she stand now? Will she be barred from ceremonial occasions like these in the future? If so, what will her role be? As the monarchy enters a critical phase, will she still be a major influence behind the throne? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, would like to make a short statement. Your Royal Highness. Diana chose a charity lunch to say an emotional thank you to her public. Your kindness and affection has carried me through some of the most difficult periods. And always, your love and care has eased that journey. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. She was criticized for using such a dramatically public way to say goodbye. I think she felt she had an obligation, if she was going to say 
some sort of goodbye to say it on a grand scale and to thank people. I think if she just disappeared, there would have been quite a lot of resentment, actually. So I think she did it the right way. Diana concealed her marriage difficulties for several years. But by January 1992, her feelings had become too overwhelming for further pretense. Just before Valentine's Day in India, her presentation of prizes at a polo match called for a public sign of affection between man and wife. A turn of her head said it all. I felt very much for Prince Charles. I felt he was humiliated. And at first I thought, what a dreadful thing to do to your husband. But then I gave it some more thought and I realized that Diana was just being honest and true to herself. It was almost as if they were staging um, a, the pretense of being a happy couple. And by that stage, she felt that it was unworthy of them both, I think, to pretend any longer. On the same tour, Charles abandoned his wife for a business meeting, reneging on a long-standing promise to show her the Taj Mahal, one of the great monuments to love. Diana's lone photo call gave the press a poignant image of a wife neglected by her husband. A few weeks later, on a skiing holiday in Austria, Diana heard the news that her father, Earl Spencer, had died. She left for the airport, but without the comforting arm of a husband concerned for her grief. Charles followed, but at a distance. The Spencers of Althrop are one of England's greatest noble families, but even Diana's aristocratic upbringing as the daughter of an earl couldn't adequately prepare her for marrying into the royal family. Her childhood was marred by the acrimonious divorce of her parents after her mother, Frances, left the family home when Diana was only six. Diana grew up to become very close to her father and felt his loss deeply. Her farewell words to him were, I miss you dreadfully, darling daddy, but will love you forever, Diana. Although perhaps she didn't spend exactly every second day or, or hours and hours in the company of her father, it was comforting to know that he was there and he often came out and gave interviews um, supporting her, explaining that he worried about her, he was worried that she worked too hard. And that's always a wonderful thing to know, that your father is there supporting you. At Earl Spencer's memorial service a few weeks later, Charles and Diana made a rare public appearance together with their sons as a family group. A few months later, Andrew Morton's book finally shattered any illusions of marital harmony, alleging that Charles had been having a long-standing affair with Camilla Parker Bowles. Diana was accused of complicity in the book's dramatic revelations. Later, taped conversations of a supposed phone call between herself and a male admirer were also published, adding to her pressures. During a public engagement at a hospice on Merseyside, hundreds turned out to offer their support. Her emotional vulnerability soon showed when the chairman paid her a warm tribute. The more that you do, you reflect so very sincerely the philosophy of tender loving care which is and always will be the hallmark of this hospital. Such praise brought her close to tears. This lack of composure was in sharp contrast to her normally confident public manner. Bulimia is an illness of self-induced vomiting after bouts of excessive eating. Back in 1989, Diana looked underweight. Four years later, she chose to bring discussion of this little-known illness out into the open. The illness they developed became their shameful friend by focusing their energies on controlling their bodies. They had found a refuge from having to face 
the more painful issues at the center of their lives. The press continually speculated that she was still suffering from bulimia. Recently, she was able to joke about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you're very fortunate to have your patron here today. I'm supposed to have my head down the loo for most of the day. <laughs> supposed to be dragged off in a minute with men in white coats so so if it's all right with you I thought I might postpone my nervous breakdown to a more appropriate moment the announcement of Diana and Charles's separation came as a surprise in December 1992 they arrived for a royal variety performance their last public appearance together before the Prime Minister John Major addressed the House of Commons it is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. Their Royal Highnesses have no plans to divorce and their constitutional positions are unaffected. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both to continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. Diana was now out on her own, officially independent of Charles. Determined to maintain her international status, she visited Zimbabwe and used her high profile to focus media attention onto the hidden problems of one of Africa's smaller countries. She's a campaigner with a mission to help the problems of the third world, such as AIDS and leprosy. This is the international charity platform where she can use her public position for the benefit of the world's sick and needy. The Red Cross and the Leprosy Mission, all of you, a great deal to me. I very much want it Her host, President Robert Mugabe, was completely won over and told the press. <laughs> he welcomed us with open arms and he, he was just such full of praise. He was like all the men that she's met, all the heads of state. He was totally smitten. And he told us how thrilled he was that she visited his country because he said that that meant that the world's press came along too. And that was wonderful for Zimbabwe because we saw for ourselves the problems they have with leprosy, especially with AIDS. And we publicized this around the world. And he was grateful. And he said this wouldn't have happened if the princess hadn't been here. <laughs> In North London, Chicken Shed, a theatre group offering access to the performing arts for young people of all abilities, rehearse for their latest concert. Since she became Chicken Shed's patron, their fundraising has risen substantially. Her decision to focus on fewer causes in the future means that some smaller, less well-known charities will inevitably be left with a large fundraising hole. No other member of the royal family can make such immediate contact with the public. Tactile and spontaneous, her style is unique. 
Over the last few years, her charity work has very much, in contrast to her husband's, concentrated on urgent, relevant, contemporary issues, particularly AIDS, relief, battered wives, homeless children, underprivileged children, and campaigning against drug abuse. Now, this genuinely is very close to her heart. She wanted to shed the ritual duties of royalty. She didn't really want to shed this work. So I think there's a big question mark over whether this work will continue if and when she bounces back. It's the most likely to do so. For those such as the homeless at the West London Mission, life will certainly be much greyer if Diana decides not to return. With the serious side of charity work comes the glamour of fundraising first nights. This is where Diana's talents as a performer come into their own. She plays the part of the gracious fairy tale princess with apparent ease. I think a lot of it comes very natural with her. Sometimes it just gives her a bit of a, a giggle. She knows all she has to do is turn around and do something and she'll hear this whole barrage of motor drives go off. And she usually collapses into giggles when she does that because it's sort of having a strange type of power, isn't it? I sort of, you know, just sit there and think, oh, I'll just put my look around over my shoulder and, and I'll start them all off. And it's sort of wielding a bit of power sometimes. I think it, it's, it's sort of, it touches her sense of humour. Diana's glamorous image has fueled the media's obsession with her. In Egypt, she gave them an official photo call, but for some, that just wasn't enough. Her morning swim was later intruded upon by a group of sensation-hungry photographers spying from a high-rise balcony. Both she and her detective were aware that they were being watched, but she chose to ignore them, resigned to yet again being forced back onto centre stage by a relentless audience. Diana became a victim of her own success and branded the media as the villain of the piece, the reason why she was standing down. When I started, my public life 12 years ago, I understood the media might be interested in what I did, but I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life in a manner that's been hard to bear. Well, I think her departure gives the lie to people who say that she needs the adulation. I think a subtext of that message was even a princess can overdose on intrusive publicity. If you look at those Daily Mirror gym photographs, from her point of view, not from the Royal Fan Club's point of view, in her head, she was already half out of the Royal Family, en route to being completely out of it, trying to rebuild this new private life. Now, if tiny private corners of that are going to be invaded by people drilling holes in walls and taking secret pictures of her, then that was a last straw. A lot of people couldn't understand why that was so important. That was a last straw. But as a beautiful, unattached princess, there will always be a market for new photographs. Obviously, as photographers, all the photographers say that's going to be the picture to get. It's her with a new man. That's the picture they'll go for now. They'll, they'll uh, follow her and watch her every move because that will be the ultimate picture now. And if she's going to become more of a recluse, it's going to be even more sort of a game for them to, to work to get pictures of her. With a snooping press hungry for photographs like these, will Diana ever be able to have a private life of her own? Or is she destined to remain a focus of attention for the rest of her life? Diana's immense popularity means that her personal life will never be her own, despite bowing out of public duties. She's boxed in by public opinion, and her romantic options are severely limited. 
We're not re yet ready to accept the Princess of Wales on the arm of another man. And then what man is worthy of such a famous woman, a woman we all adore? He'd have to be a very special man indeed. And um, I wouldn't envy that man. He'd, he'd be absolutely besieged and his life would be miserable. And so I think until the boys are much older and have girlfriends of their own and take a lot of the spotlight and the heat of the media off her, I think we'll probably see a very lonely princess for perhaps eight or ten years to come. Since she first became Princess of Wales, Diana's life has undergone a series of fundamental changes. Now she is seen as the lonely princess in the tower. All her life, she's been denied personal happiness. Her mother left home when she was six. Her father remarried a woman she didn't get on with. Uh, she was sent away to school. There are a long line of betrayals in her life. Her husband was in love with another woman from be before he married her, right through the marriage. She even, and nobody ever believes me when I say this, but I know it to be true, regards the Morton book as a betrayal. I don't for a moment accept that the princess, quotes, cooperated with that book in any way at all. And uh, she regards that as yet another betrayal. Uh, for the moment, officially, she has to continue to say that she will abide by the royal pleasure. She's the mother of the future king. She won't do anything to rock the royal boat. In the public's view, Diana has replaced the queen as the nation's primary mother figure. She's reinforced this by publicly announcing the importance her sons will have in her future life. My first priority will continue to be our children, William and Harry, who deserve as much love and care and attention as I am able to give, as well as a, an appreciation of the tradition into which they were born. As the mother to an heir to the British throne, she will have to fight to maintain influence over her children against the considerable power of Charles and the royal family. As a mother myself, I just think I can't imagine anything worse than, than the idea of your children being taken away by another family, which is, in effect, far more powerful than you. So she's got to fight like a tigress for those boys. And, um, and if she, in the process of fighting for them and for what the way she wants to bring them up, she might smother them a bit, but they're very, very fond of her. I mean, William just adores his mother, and so does Harry. Her sons were her main solace during the years of her marriage breakup. Now they will relieve the loneliness of her new situation as an officially separated wife. But without a loving partner and with no one else to project love onto, there is a danger that she may become a smothering mother like the wife of Edward VII, Queen Alexandra. She compensated for her husband's philandering by being overly possessive of her sons, the Duke of Clarence and Prince George. There is a real risk that she will, in many ways, smother them, uh, be too uh, overwhelming a mother, so that it would be difficult when they do grow up to break away from her and um, make relationships themselves with other women. They may, like many boys who are smothered by uh, a mother such as Diana clearly is, uh, they may still f feel married to her even when they're grown up and turning away to another woman could be an act of infidelity. Diana often gives the impression that the problems of the separation haven't affected her, but the pressure has taken its toll. Close observers like Jane Fincher noticed a change. First thing I noticed is there was never any eye contact with her. She never once looked around towards us. Normally she would look around and smile just acknowledge that you're there and there would be some eye contact there was no eye contact she was sitting with her heads down and sort of wringing her hands and i thought then there's something wrong with her she looks so sad she just even though you know, that smile came up now and again but there was such a sadness about her sitting there diana's been under immense pressure for the last two or three years and i think in a curious way the years since the split has been more pressured and more intense than the year before it which was pretty intense Diana's a classic example of somebody actually who has matured through suffering. Uh, she's grown up an awful lot in the last few years. 
very level-headed, very savvy, very shrewd and wise about human nature, relationships and so on. She has a very tight band of friends, mostly female, who she can call on night or day. Rosa Monckton is part of this trusted circle of confidants. The daughter of Lord Monckton, she is a successful businesswoman in her own right, running the London branch of the internationally known jeweler, Tiffany's. There's someone who's, who's got a successful business going in London, totally from, from absolutely nothing. It was her own idea to launch Tiffany's again in London. And I think the princess thinks, well, if she can do it, I can do it too. I can start up my own, my own show and I can make it a success. Encouraged by such friends, Diana had built up a powerful role for herself, completely independent of Charles. In November 1993, she made her last official visit to Wales before announcing her decision to leave public life. She arrived in Carmarthen to open a new wing for the West Wales General Hospital. After 12 years of experience, she's a consummate poised performer, relaxed and fully in command of the situation. A very different woman to the new bride Charles first brought to meet the Welsh people in 1981. Thousands turned out for the chance of seeing their first Princess of Wales for 70 years. Nervous and unsure of where to go next, at first she had to follow her husband's lead. But she was a fast learner and was soon working the crowd like an expert. Already she was stealing Charles's limelight. This unexpected removal from centre stage became something he would never be able to cope with. Many wonder why he ever married such a dazzling bride in the first place. I think he had a lot of doubts and he was persuaded to marry her by us, by the British public and by the media especially, because we all wrote endlessly about how perfect she was for the job. I remember the very first time she was named in a newspaper with the Prince of Wales when she was spotted on a riverbank at Balmoral fishing with him. The Sun newspaper the very next day uh, revealed who she was and said she has all the perfect qualities to be queen. The very first story written about her with the prince, she was the ideal English rose. And from then on, I mean, we all picked up on that. She was perfect for the, for the role. She's still perfect for the role. She's just not perfect for the Prince of Wales. That's the problem. Even though Diana has now cut back on her public life, her prominence over Charles as the people's favourite seems assured. It's not as if she upstages him deliberately, as she's often accused of. The point is she sells newspapers and he doesn't. Uh, we saw that occasion a week or so after her speech when she went to Ulster for the day. Huge crowds. He went to London. Five old pensioners standing on a corner. That was it. Tension mounted as they waited for the prince's arrival. That is the nature of things. At such traditional family turnouts as the Queen Mother's birthday, Diana has very definitely been absent. She and Charles have only been seen together twice in public since the separation, and then only on official occasions. The Windsors had closed ranks. She knew she wasn't welcome in the family anymore. She knew that they resented the fact that she'd upstaged them ever since the beginning and I think that really would get you down after a while uh, year in year out when the rest of them felt that they worked very hard and didn't get any recognition because she was so high profile and she was such an overwhelmingly popular personality that none of them really got a look in. A year after her official separation from Charles, Diana once more joined the royal family for the Christmas Day service at Sandringham Church and again took centre stage. Shortly afterwards, however, she left abruptly to spend the rest of Christmas elsewhere. The Queen was kind enough to invite her to Sandringham and I think that they all wanted to make sure that the children had a wonderful day and that's why she decided to go. Diana leaves an unfillable gap in the official royal lineup. There'll no longer be a place for her on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. 
That is clearly not an easy family to marry into. Why not? Because they treat the people that marry them, even if, like Diana, they single-handedly rejuvenate the institution over 10 years, they treat them like second-class citizens. And the Windsors are living in the past. That is the subtext to all this. Unless they change their act very quickly, the whole drama that is still going to unfold, this story is going to run and run, will make the monarchy look like it's past its sell-by date. And they've really got to adopt some radical reforms. Diana is cutting her losses, and the world of royal duties is losing its prime performer. If she bounces back, I think it will be on the international stage perhaps something like a Princess Diana Foundation that works for underprivileged children particularly, but disadvantaged people all over the world, leaving the UK clear for Prince Charles to try and re rehabilitate himself and concentrate his work there. And if he doesn't manage it, then she can't be accused of having upstaged him in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Up to now, the magnetism of royalty has helped make her foreign trips powerful mediums for promoting her causes. It remains to be seen whether her future detachment from the royal family will affect her pulling power. <laughs> Diana's profile abroad is phenomenal, even at 5,000 feet in the Himalayan mountains of Nepal. Her experience has brought her a long way, but is there more to come? Any woman becomes perhaps at her best when she's in her mid-30s. And I think that's the classic, you know, a woman's in her prime. We'll see a princess in her prime in her mid-30s. I think she'll reorganize, rest up, rethink her role, and come back perhaps bigger and better than ever because she'll have had time the first time in the 12 years that she's been Princess of Wales to think, what do I want to do? Not what they want me to do, but what is best for me? And what is best for her well, perhaps will be what is best for the causes that she's dedicated to. If it's the end of an era for a woman who's dominated world his public image for so long, it'll be several years before the next generation, her sons, can continue where she's left off. As the Princess of Wales moves on, the question is, who will fill the gap she leaves behind? This week on Real Life, do-it-yourself real estate. Be brave, sell your own home. A straightforward guide that can save you thousands. Real Life at 6.30, following 7 Nightly News.